Yes. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to this uh, BioClock Academy session of today. It's very nice uh, to see you all here. Um, so uh, my name is Hannah Brooks, uh, and together with Laura Pape, I will be the host for today's session. We are both uh, PhD students within the BioClock uh, Consortium, uh, and this consortium organizes these uh, monthly seminars. Um, so the, the main aim of BioClock, uh, which is a Dutch project, uh, is to study all different aspects of the biological clock. And this is really a broad ranging from um, human society over human health uh, to the environment. Uh, and so we also organize these uh, lecture sessions. Uh, and these are, of course, open to everyone who is interested in chronobiology, but the specific aim is um, to attract young uh, researchers um, and to explain uh, basic concepts to them and equip them with proper knowledge of uh, yeah, the experts in the field. Um, so this uh, session is every month, uh, every third Wednesday, and uh, the, the time uh, schedule for today is about 40 minutes of talk and then uh, 50 minutes for you to ask questions and you can already put these questions into the chat uh, so we will keep track of them uh, but yeah you can also ask them afterwards um yes so um thank you hannah for this introduction and also let me introduce our guest speaker for today today we invited dr tom de boer very happy to have you here he is an associate professor at the uh, neurophysiology group in, of the department Cell and Chemical Biology at the uh, Leiden University Medical Center. And as a neuroscientist, he's investigating the interaction between sleep and circadian or circaannual rhythms. And in his recent research, um, he investigated the influ influence of different aspects of, um, for example, light, uh, pharmaca and age on sleep and circadian rhythms. And the topic of today's talk will be clocks and sleep, in which we will learn more about how sleep is regulated um, by the circadian and homeostatic mechanisms and much more. So welcome, Tom. The floor is yours. You can share your screen. Uh, and yeah, looking forward to your talk. OK, thank you very much. Move you out a bit. Okay, um, so thank you for the invitation. And um, I have put together a, a presentation about sleep and the circadian clock. But I also realized I have visited some bio clock meetings that the group is very diverse. So I'm not going to try to go into it too deep. I try to keep it uh, more general, so not to lose too many people. I hope I succeed in that, but we'll, we'll never know. <laughs> um, so the topic is clocks and sleep. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is, is how sleep is regulated. And you will see that this is approached uh, from two different sides. One way is to look at brain areas and how they um, induce sleep and wakefulness and how they work together to, to make us awake or go to sleep. Um, the other way is to look at it is, 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 is more in when it is decided by the brain to go to sleep. And that is an interaction between a, a sleep homeostatic process and, and the circadian clock. And at the end, I hope to show you, if I have time, that there are also interactions between these two uh, functions that the sleep homeostat at least can influence the uh, function of uh, the circadian clock, depending on the level of the sleep pressure that is present in the brain at a certain time. So, as I said, when you think about sleep, uh, there are two approaches in the field. Uh, that look at this and, and one way is to look at how do we fall asleep 
And the other is then, when do we fall asleep? Um, and of course, then that is usually brought back to how does the brain fall asleep or when does the brain fall asleep? And when we go to the first question, this uh, is more a neurophysiological or a neurological question, uh, which started approximately 100 years ago uh, by research by uh, von Economo. He uh, was lucky enough to live in a time that there, were, uh, there was this disease uh, which uh, called encephalitis lethargica, which uh, caused people to actually not be able to sleep anymore or sleep a lot. And he was able to uh, receive post-mortem brains of these people. And he noticed that there were uh, areas in the, in the, the hypothalamus which uh, showed lesions. And depending on the, the position of the lesion, patient was either uh, suffering from prolonged insomnia before death or um, had prolonged sleepiness uh, before death. And it was clear that, that uh, one of the areas then was involved in inducing sleep and the other area was more in keeping uh, people awake. And now I'm going to yeah, skip almost 100 years of research and coming back to what we think we know now. This is uh, from a review by Cliff uh, Saper published in Nature in 2005, which, which gives a very good explanation of sort of the textbook knowledge that we have now. And uh, we recognize uh, three types of uh, clusters of nuclei or brain areas that are involved in, in certain uh, functions uh, related to sleep. Uh, one group is on the left, that is the ascending arousal system, which is uh, involved in, in wakefulness and REM sleep. And the other side is the ventrolateral preoptic area that is involved in uh, promoting sleep. And uh, the basic principle in how this works is actually quite uh, simple. We have the, the red areas like the locus ceruleus and the rafa and, and some other areas that are wake active. Uh, they uh, have different uh, neurotransmitters uh, that, that they uh, release. Uh, we have the, the classical monoamines, acetylcholine, histamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, and dopamine, which have been known since the 1960s and 70s to be involved in, in wakefulness induction. Um, Later, this is approximately 20, 25 years ago, people are, are also discovered orexin, which uh, is uh, actually very important in stabilizing uh, the wake uh, or maintaining wakefulness. If you do not have orexin, uh, you suffer from, for instance, uh, narcolepsy and can fall asleep almost instantaneously at very inappropriate uh, times. Um, we also know more recently that, that uh, GABA and melanin concentrating hormone are involved. And these are all released uh, to, to sort of stabilize uh, wakefulness. Uh, it's uh, released in the cortex, uh, among others. Um, then we have uh, two areas, the lateral segmental area and, and the pedunculopontine segmental area. They are releasing acetylcholine and they are active in waking and REM sleep. Um, so uh, in REM sleep, they are the sole uh, areas active. Um, and this acetylcholine that is then released activates some parts of the brain, which gives you then maybe dreamlike uh, things, but it also uh, makes that, uh, shows that not all areas are active for instance, memory and, and the, the, the prefrontal or cortex is not very active. So you do not remember that stuff that you dream about is not quite correct. And also logical thinking is a bit out. So that's why some dreams, although they are not very really realistic, seem to be very real anyway. Uh, but these are the areas that are 
um, active during waking. On the other side, we have uh, the ventrolateral preoptic area, which is promoting sleep. And this is basically releasing GABA and some galanin. And with that, it is um, uh, reducing activity in the areas that are active during waking. And, and if you reduce this activity, then uh, the brain falls asleep. Um, this is sort of uh, the, the schedule that, that we have now. And until uh, 1999, I don't know whether you can see my pointer. Can you see my pointer? Uh, we didn't know about uh, the orexin that sort of stabilizes this behavior. So we had on the other one hand, the ventrolateral preoptic area, on the other hand, the wake inducing areas, and they were sort of keeping each other in a, a system that is uh, from electronics is called a flip-flop circuit which means that one light is on or the other light is on so it's either awake or the brain is asleep but it's not somewhere in between it's just that it flip-flops back and forth depending on who's active at some time of day and that is not very very predictable and only around 1999 2000 uh, orexin was um, discovered and it was established that this actually is actively uh, inducing uh, promoting wakefulness uh, uh, but not hindering sleep when it occurs. And, and basically, uh, this is now called the flip-flop model. It sounds maybe a bit funny, but this is all taken over from the electronics uh, research and, and is now introduced in the sleep field as the model for uh, sleep and wakefulness. When does the brain fall asleep? When does it wake up? And uh, since the discovery of this orexin pathways, uh, people have added a lot of new influences. I mean, uh, last week I saw that there's also an orexin pathway going to the ventrolateral preoptic area, inhibiting the inhibition of the wake areas uh, and therefore, therefore uh, stabilizing wake. So there's, there's still a lot of research going on in, in this, this area. Um, the other way is uh, or to look at it is, is to see, okay, when does the brain fall asleep? Because here you do not have, uh, in this system, you do not have a regulator that says, okay, now you have to be awake for a long period of time, or now you can be active for a period of time. Um, um, there's also not, not something like sleep depth that is involved uh, in this system. It's just, it's just a, a circuitry that induces wakefulness or sleep. Um, if you look at, at the other way that you can look at sleep regulatory processes, you can either di uh, divide that into two functions that are there to regulate sleep. One is the uh, homeostatic component that uh, builds, uh, that basically says, okay, sleep pressure builds up during waking and decreases during sleep. This is something that we all can relate to, I guess, if we have been awake for a long period of time, we sort of feel in our brain that uh, sleep is uh, yeah, pushing us somewhere or the sleepiness. Um, and when we wake up in the morning, we feel refreshed and do not feel this pressure anymore. On the other hand, you have the circadian process. Sleep is timed at the same time of day every day, which then sort of takes care of. Uh, uh, when uh, you fall asleep, and when you wake up. And these two are thought to regulate together the timing and depth of sleep. I'm going to introduce that a little bit more. Uh, you can take, for instance, um, sleep is researched in the lab uh, by recording electroencephalogram, the EEG, uh, from the brain, and muscle activity. And this is, these are traces from, from a mouse. This is the EEG, this is the EMG for, for waking, for non-REM sleep, for REM sleep. And you see, you can distinguish the states relatively well. If you're a bit trained, EEG and waking has a fast frequency. Uh, EMG is, is uh, changing all the time. It has also high activity. 
as during sleep, EEG, EMG is, is low. You actually only see some heart rate here still. Uh, and you can distinguish non-REM sleep and REM sleep. Non-REM sleep has more of these slow waves in it, and REM sleep has these faster waves uh, in it. And if you record them over, for instance, 48 hours, and you have a group of animals, and you score that uh, nicely every score on a four second basis so every four seconds we make a decision does the animal sleep or is it awake is it in non-REM sleep or is it in REM sleep and then you can make these plots of hourly percentages of waking non-REM sleep and REM sleep over time where you have here 24 hour baseline with the rest phase and the active phase so here there's more waking than here um, here we have done an experiment we've sleep deprived the animals uh, for six hours and then we look at uh, the response after that. We compare the amount of sleep and waking with the baseline situation. You can see that there's less waking after the sleep deprivation and more normal sleep. So you see that the annual response to this deprivation by uh, yeah, yeah. Re regaining uh, sleep, non-REM sleep and REM sleep, and sort of uh, reducing in the amount of waking. But there's more that you can do with uh, the EEG. You can make a spectrum of the EEG. Look at what are the main frequencies in this signal. I've done that here for these 16 seconds that we see here. And you can see that then in waking, you see a peak around seven, eight, nine Hertz. Uh, the same you see for REM sleep. And for non-REM sleep, you see that actually the slow waves are the most active component. Uh, so that's the frequencies below five Hertz. And there's something special with these slow waves in, in non-REM sleep. Uh, you can see that uh, if you take uh, deep slow wave sleep in humans and you compare that, uh, for instance, with the spectrum of REM sleep in humans, that you have uh, more slow waves in the slow wave sleep than in REM sleep. Uh, this already starts if you if you compare uh, deeper states two sleep with the states one sleep, you see these slow waves uh, peaking. And if you just look at this activity in the frequencies below five hertz and plot that over time again, you can see that uh, here is, is the scoring in the humans. So you have the vigilant states in humans who score more vigilant states, uh, states non-REM sleep states one, states two, the deeper non-REM sleep stages three and four. Here you have REM sleep and you do that over a night of eight hours. You can see the cycling of the sleep between non-REM sleep and REM sleep. If you look at the activity in the slow wave range, you can also see that uh, there is a modulation of the slow waves uh, cycle by cycle. And over cycles, you can see that from cycle one to cycle two to cycle three to cycle four, there's a reduction in the amount of slow wave activity that you see. Um, now, already very early on in sleep research, this is a figure from a, a paper in 1937. It was seen that you have a lot of slow waves in the beginning of the night. It's also very difficult to wake somebody up when he has a lot of slow waves. There was actually a nice correlation between the two. Uh, and this has been later confirmed in, in many uh, studies that if slow waves are prominent in the EEG, it is very difficult to wake somebody up with the sound, for instance. So this is very deep. And this slow waves, uh, if you now take a rat or a human, uh, here you have one, two, three, four non-REM REM sleep cycles of the human. If you look at the slow wave activity on average of a group of human sleepers, you will see that from cycle to cycle to cycle, uh, the slow wave activity decreases. Now, if you take a rat, and this is a 12-hour recording of a single rat, and you look at slow waves and you see, okay, it's changing much faster between the states. But if you look at the general pattern over the 12 hours, there's a gradual decrease in slow wave activity. 
and you can plot that uh, the same way as in, in the human, but then in two hourly values. Now, if you keep the rat awake for 24 hours or you let the human skip a night and you look at the following night, you see actually that both show an increase in the slow activity in normal sleep. Um, but it also gradually then decreases in the course of, of the sleep period again. But there's something changing when you sleep deprive uh, a mammal and it's changing in the brain and it's then uh, changing the brain and, and the brain is producing more slow waves. In Now, if you can then take different sleep deprivation durations, uh, this, is, this is my own example of, of the Jungarian hamster. This was the, actually the species that I did my, my thesis, uh, PhD thesis on. And I was looking for also other stuff, but I also did the experiment with the different durations of sleep deprivation. And if I sleep deprived the animals for one and a half hours, I got an increase uh, of, in slow activity to 150% of baseline levels. If I did it for four hours, the increase was up to 200% of baseline levels. And then the animal was allowed to sleep and then values gradually decreased. But here are some examples of where this experiment was also done in rats and humans and cats, European ground squirrels, and then the mouse. And you basically see that all of them show this increase depending on the function of, uh, on the prior waking duration. Now, what about the other way around? If you let, for instance, a human take a nap in the afternoon, uh, experiment is also done. Uh, here we have the baseline again, the four cycles of, of non-REM sleep with gradually decreasing slow activity in the course of uh, non-REM sleep episodes. Here's the nap, which is taken between six and eight in the evening. And if you then look at the post-nap, slow effectivity, it is reduced compared to the baseline situation. If you look at other frequencies, for instance, the, the spindle frequencies that you have uh, in the 12 to 15 hertz, there's not such a decrease. Now you can already feel a bit, you can uh, start uh, playing around with this. Uh, there's something that we can predict from, from, from duration of, of sleep and wakefulness, and that is the slow effectivity, the non rem sleep. Uh, so you can look at the, the beginning of the night and the end of the night, and you can see that the slow effectivity is decreasing in the course of the, of the, the sleep period. And you can let people come in the lab uh, either at, at 10 in the morning and let them sleep, or at 12 in the morning, and they can take naps, and, and the longer they are uh, awake, the higher the slow effectivity in this, this nap will be. Uh, if you let them sleep later, you'll get values above baseline levels. If you let them sleep after 24 hour sleep deprivation, levels will be up here. Um, you can even let the nappers come back in the evening and let them sleep, uh, the example uh, of uh, six o'clock uh, in the evening we saw, uh, that is this one. But also the morning one, you can actually predict quite well, and see here already the model coming in, uh, how deep this sleep will be and that it will be less than the baseline level. Um, and this is what we call then sleep homeostasis. Um, this is the, the simple model with the baseline levels of, of uh, slow wave activity and, and depth of sleep. This is uh, the, the dashed line is, is the, the nap. This is the sleep deprivation of 24 hours. And uh, you can, for instance, do this in mice uh, and predict and, and fit uh, how, how well, how deep they will sleep after the sleep deprivation. Um, Peter Ackermann has taken this um, uh, to a ridiculous detailed level in, in human sleep. He said, he, if you tell him um, when people fall asleep, when their REM sleep episodes will be, uh, 
how long they've been awake before that he can sort of predict from almost minute to minute how deep on average uh, these people will sleep and this is uh, from the textbook principles and practice of sleep medicine this is sort of textbook stuff nowadays and people now also make predictions for shift work and jet lag to see how alert some uh, somebody will be on is will probably be after a certain protocol um, now what what comes out of this is that uh, if you for instance do the sleep deprivation that we had over here in the mouse or the, I think it's a mouse uh, you can see that the mouse recovers non-REM sleep and REM sleep and here you can see how much sleep it lost and how much it gains and there's a discrepancy between the loss and the gain it, it, it will never get the amount of sleep back that it lost in these six hours for REM sleep it, it works a bit better you can see that it's, it, it gains something more back and it's almost at, at the baseline level again but if you include the changes in slow wave activity which we then called cumulative slow wave energy and you see that this is the baseline increase in, in slow wave energy over 24 hours and this is what happens when you sleep deprive for six hours and then let the animal recover you see that after 12 to 14 hours it is actually indistinguishable from baseline again so recovery from sleep deprivation or recovering a sleep depth not only has to do with increasing the amount of sleep but also with increasing the intensity of sleep or the depth of sleep that's what i'm saying here now that's one side of the story the other side is that um, sleep homeostasis alone does not work you can you can think about this this regulatory system with, with, with the threshold and uh, sleep threshold and awake threshold if the upper limit is reached uh, the brain will fall asleep if the lower limit is reached the brain will wake up but for instance if you make a perturbation and you sleep deprive uh, somebody for a certain period of time and then let it come back between these two thresholds it will be out of uh, yeah out of um, phase for the rest of its life um, so re sleep regulation needs a clock and um, well we are here in a bio clock group so i assume that uh, most of you know that the mammalian circadian clock is located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the idea is that the thresholds that we see here are not straight but have a wavy shape and that uh, you have your process your circadian process that makes these wavy shapes of these thresholds and your process s fits in between that you get a system where uh, you go to sleep here you wake uh, you you wake up here you go to sleep here and we will see later that if you perturb this system uh, that you can act that so you sleep deprive somebody for for a certain amount of time that you get back within this within uh, one or two days back to to, to normal sleep um, of the clock we know that this is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus that regulates these these circadian processes process s um i've <clears throat> Yeah, we still do not know what the homeostatic process is, uh, what it stands for. I will give you one hint uh, later on, which uh, eventually I will say it's also not that. Uh, we do not know what it is. Uh, and, and if you ask Alex Borbe, who came with, up with this sort of idea about a sleep process, he will actually uh, tell you. We don't know and we will probably never find out but uh, it, it works uh, and, and why did they introduce this, uh, this this model in the first place that were some uh, things that were happening in the in research uh, that were published in the literature that could not be um, uh, explained uh, very well with it um, 
yeah, existing models. One of them was this experiment where from uh, Arkerstedt and Gilberg, who had people in their lab, uh, who they either let sleep at the normal time, or they let them sleep um, four hour, go to sleep four hours later or eight hours later or uh, even more later. And um, they expected, well, okay, if we sleep deprive somebody for uh, four hours or eight hours, we let them go to bed eight hours later, they'll probably sleep uh, more. And the funny thing was that they found out that total sleep actually went down. Uh, they asked the subjects to sort of get out of bed and wake up whenever they felt refreshed. Uh, subjects had no time clues in their uh, bedroom. Uh, and what happened is that spontaneous awakening and, and feeling refreshed was uh, shortening first uh, in the first parts. And that could not be explained with existing models, but it could be explained with the two process model. Uh, if you let somebody go to bed uh, four hours later or eight hours later and sleep, then at some point, this sleep will bump into this lower threshold, which is going up here, and uh, sleep will be shorter. And only when you go over this bump and you let somebody go to sleep, then sleep will get longer. And you can see this is a sine wave, and I've shown you this. This is not an exact sine wave. It's skewed a bit. Uh, this skewing is probably because this data point did not fit with the model. Uh, and, and they had to cut it down a bit here. But um, this is one of the, the reasons why the, this model was introduced, because it could explain these kind of data better than. Thank you very much. Another one was uh, a set of data was uh, produced by uh, Ashok and Wafer in, in bunkers, uh, where they had people in isolation and for a uh, month, 46 days we have here. Who's willing to do that anymore? Um, but uh, they had sleep and wakefulness. Uh, so black is, is wakefulness, white is, is sleep. <clears throat> and here we have the peak of the body temperature. And you can see, okay, this is going very well. Um, people are free running in constant conditions like other uh, animals do. Actually, this was the first proof that humans have a circadian clock. Um, that is free running. And then something happens. Here goes the body temperature and here goes sleep and wakefulness. And it sort of makes a jump here or it, it starts free running on its own. Uh, nobody knew exactly what the interpretation was, but the period was suddenly 29 hours for sleep and wakefulness and 25 hours for body temperature. And um, okay. People said, okay, now we have to introduce two clocks, one for sleep and wakefulness and one for uh, the body temperature. So uh, humans probably have two clocks instead of one. Um, but if you fiddle around with this model a bit, pointing here to the right upper corner, you can actually introduce this kind of skipping. In, in so here we have one normal day and then we have a day where uh, process the homeostatic process misses the upper threshold and moves on to the next day. So you have, suddenly have a day of almost 48 hours. And if you yeah, tweak it a bit, and this is then what the model does, you can actually get a pattern that looks very much like what we see here in the actual data. Um, so that was the other reason why the model was introduced, because it could explain with one clock and the homeostatic process, uh, the funny data that was found. And this is sort of introduced uh, 40 years ago, the two process model of sleep decoration by Alex Borbe, Serge Zidane, and Domin Beersma. So this is the Groningen corner, this is the Zurich corner. Uh, later, Peter Ageman joined, and, and these or people actually uh, put this together and, and push this forward, trying to understand what was going on. And basically, the simple model you can try at home. 
and see, okay, what happens if I sleep sleep uh, deprive myself until the morning? Uh, how long do I sleep? When do I wake up? What happens? And you will see that whatever you do within two days, you are back in phase with your normal sleep and should be feel refreshed and recovered. Okay. So I started off with this and I came eventually with this. And you can see that here, the circadian clock is very important. And here there's no circadian clock at all. The SCN is not mentioned. And that is uh, one of the things that, that is basically our problem now. Um, Saper in the same paper mentions the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Uh, talks about, uh, writes about its outputs, says that the uh, dorsal media hypothalamus is very important as an output to regulate wakefulness and to regulate sleep. Uh, but there is no model connecting the two. Um, there are some people, including me, who make sort of not very uh, good efforts in, in unifying the two. Uh, by saying, okay, we have here the wake-inducing areas, we have here the ventral lateral preoptic area here, we have the SCN, which sort of gives a circadian modulated signal to the dorsal median hypothalamus, which then reduces activity in the ventral lateral preoptic area and in induces activity in the, the lateral hypothalamus. And with that, depending on time of day, it does this stronger or less strong, you can induce a sleep-wake cycle. But we are not yet at a unifying theory of sleep regulation, connecting the two together in a model that can predict or uh, give predictions about how it's going to go. Um, so we have now, we had this, we had the intensity and the amount of duration that sort of the way to compensate sleep depth. And we have the clock that mainly determines the timing Therefore, the amount or the duration of sleep, but not its intensity. I still have some time, right? Yes, uh, seven minutes left. Okay, maybe we'll make it. Okay, um, now you've seen in the model, these are, the, the, the two interact only at the thresholds. So either going to sleep, or waking up, then the two meet and, and say, okay, we have to make a switch. We have to, uh, we have to switch the, the one around and let it run in, in the other direction. But are there interactions between the two? And this is, this is where I started off uh, when I came here in, in Leiden 20 years ago. Uh, we built a setup uh, where a rat uh, could be placed in, in recording EEG and ENG, but also a neuronal activity from the SCN with, with an electrode. So we got these type of signals with, with spiking, but we also got the EEG and the EMG from the animal. And, and then you can make uh, plots like this, where we have an individual animal, where we have the hypnogram with waking, non-sleep and REM sleep. This was done in constant dark conditions. You have your slow effectivity, which is high during sleep phase and the beginning of the sleep phase it decreases and then in the course of the active phase it's sort of you see when it naps it increases again you see your homeostat going up and down but you also see your clock ticking your scn scn activity is high during the subjective day and low during the subjective night and you can see that it's sort of going up and down like that but you also can see that if you do this in an animal that is freely moving that there's a lot of stuff happening top of that it's not a, a very smooth line and that rubbish up there one of the things that is happening is that if the animal goes from non-REM sleep to REM sleep the SCN neural activity actually goes up that's these peaks here also when it goes from non-REM to waking it, it goes up now if it it is moving very strongly we couldn't record during that period but you can see that and also when the animal goes from waking to non sleep, it goes down. So there is some information flowing from sleep to the SCN because it sort of, it, it changes its behavior depending on the state. 
another thing that we did was do the sleep deprivation experiment, and you get a nice increase in slow effectivity again. But what we see here is also that there's a decrease in the multi unit activity of the SCN. SCN becomes less active when sleep pressure is high. These are the average that we get there. This is the multi unit activity in the SCN. You can see that in the baseline, it's, 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 it's showing a very nice uh, circadian pattern after the sleep deprivation is gone. But on the next day, actually, this pattern is back. And sort of this sort of lasts as long as slow effectivity is high. Now, already in 1997, uh, Ralph Misselberger showed that if you sleep deprive a hamster and you try to shift it with its, its rhythm with light, you will not succeed. There's no phase shift anymore compared to phase shifts with or without the animal having a wheel. Then you give the light pulse when it's not sleep deprived. Um, we've repeated that experiment. Also others that here we have our experiment in the mouse. Uh, we have the, the normal condition. Actually, we did a uh, type two uh, phase shift, so we gave the light pulse at the beginning of the, the dark, uh, dark uh, constant continuous darkness. We could see the phase shift is larger when you give the light pulse only. But if you sleep deprive the animals before that for six hours, your sleep, uh, your phase shift is less. Now, what is changing in the brain when you sleep deprived? There's a lot of stuff that changes in the brain, but one of the most prominent things is uh, the release of adenosine. Uh, ATP is during activity of, of neurons is, is broken down to AMP, eventually to adenosine. This moves to the extracellular space and, and then sits on adenosine receptors on the outside. And, um, it's it's most uh, mostly then reducing the activity of neurons. So neurons become less active when adenosine is increasing in extracellular space. And, and if you sleep deprive animals, this is an example of uh, Taria porca hyscan, and in cats, I think you sleep deprive animals for six hours, you see that the adenosine levels increase, whereas when it can recover, it can sleep adenosine levels decrease. And for a short period of time, actually, people thought that adenosine was process S. Uh, we now know better. But uh, and, and to put this in perspective, these are the cups of coffee. Adenosine receptors are blocked by caffeine. So the reason why we drink coffee to stay alert and awake is because we want to block this effect of adenosine in the brain. Um, so we did an experiment where we, we, we've, we've shown you the, 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 the phase shifting effect, but we also implanted electrodes in the SCN. And to show you what the relationship is between the two, you can probably notice you have this phase response curve uh, for, 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 for light pulses. Uh, at some periods of time, light pulses are more effective than in others. Uh, they are most effective when the animal expects actually it to be dark. And the same it goes for uh, light uh, responses in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. If you do not give too high light levels, the, actually the SCN will respond very well to this light pulse uh, in, when it expects darkness. So CT12, 8, 9, but not around CT7 or CT10. If the light if it responds, then it responds usually with an increase in activity, which you, you see here. Um, so different light levels. Here we have the same experiment, but then with low levels, higher levels of light. If you give low levels, there's a small response. If you give higher levels, there's a higher response. Of activity. This is a pulse of, of uh, 100 seconds. What we did was we did an experiment where we did a sleep deprivation and gave light pulses at, at CT14, where the animals expected to be dark, and uh, but we sleep deprived them before that or not. Now this is the control experiment. We give six pulses of five minutes, and every time you can see 
that the activity in the SCN goes up. This is the control situation. After six hours of sleep deprivation, this response was completely gone. These were the averages. And then we thought, okay, what happens if you give caffeine? Is, is also the response in the SCN dependent on uh, adenosine and caffeine? Uh, so we did, again, the sleep deprivation experiment and we gave, uh, yeah, I think the equivalent of three cups of coffee. Um, and you can see that then the response is higher than after sleep deprivation and you sort of get your normal response uh, to the to, to light back. And so there is an interaction. If you have an increased sleep pressure, apparently the circadian clock does not respond very well to light. And um, last year, we, Caroline Reichert, uh, Hans-Peter Landolt, and I wrote a, a review about adenosine, caffeine, and, and sleep and circadian rhythms. And this was sort of the overview that I made, and I want to sort of end with that. You have the eye, you have the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which then gives you a rest activity rhythm. And there are different levels where you can see what, what happens uh, with um, uh, sleep deprivation or control situations or caffeine. We've seen that the amplitude of the, uh, the activity in the SCN is reduced after sleep deprivation, that the light response is reduced after sleep deprivation, but can be recovered with caffeine. What I didn't show is that, for instance, the bold signal in the human brain also responds to sleep deprivation, uh, bold signal in the suprachiasmatic area, uh, that even the free running period uh, is dependent on whether animals drink normal water or caffeinated water, uh, free running period becomes slower, but also the phase shift to light under control conditions or sleep deprivation, you see a reduction, but if you give caffeine, you actually see an, an increase. Now, we tried to see if the eye is also involved here. So we did an electroretinogram after control and, and sleep deprivation did not find a difference. So it's, it's very likely that the, the effects are coming from the SCN, although this is not conclusive. Um, so to end um, sleep homeostasis, sleep deprivation, you can recover sleep by increasing the intensity or the amount. The clock determines the timing of this uh, sleep and, and can influence the duration from there but not its intensity, but maybe sleep pressure can in, in influence functioning of the clock. Uh, at least it is clear that it changes uh, the amplitude and its response to light. With that, I want to acknowledge uh, yeah, sponsors and funding. Our group is Joko Meyer here. And uh, I also want to acknowledge Hester van Diepen, who did uh, the experiments with the caffeine and, and the light responses uh, after we discovered in a small pilot uh, study that this may work. She actually very enthusiastically picked this up. Um, so uh, I'm very glad that she did that. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tom, for your very interesting talk.